Thank you, Dr. Marquardt. <clears throat> Good to see, well, I can't see anybody, I can just see me, but uh, so thankful for everybody that's online that's uh, joined us this morning. Uh, as you know, I have great respect for Dr. Marquardt and for the work that he's doing now leading the center and uh, just a privilege to be with you. I want to just talk to you today, staying in the theme of the Lytle Center this week about um, leading in a crisis, leading in a pandemic. Um, and I've got a thought that I hope is from scripture and from God uh, for you today. Uh, but we are living in a storm. We're, we're in a pandemic, a world crisis. I just checked the numbers about one and a half million cases in the world, 90,000 deaths in the US, 430,000 cases, 15,000 deaths. Many in our economy, uh, when they look at their economy, they're predicting perhaps unemployment as high as 30%, which is greater than that which was in the Great Depression. Um, our loved ones are hurting. Um, there are layoffs going all around us. We had a call this morning to our Houston CEOs in the last two weeks, four of the nine CEOs that were on the phone had lost their own jobs uh, in this crisis. Uh, and the quarantine has, has caused a lot of uh, change in our lives. And you all know that. But God is this uh, tremendous performer in times of crisis. If you came to Summit, it's in times of Red Sea moments. And I think you'll admit that all of us, when we're in times of crisis, when things are changing and uncertain, the first thing we want to do is get to something that's not moving, move towards strength, move towards stability. If you've ever been out on the Great Lakes in a storm like I have, man, you want to get to land. You want to get somewhere where things are not moving and you can count on them. And so in the midst of that thought process, trying to lead, be the captain of your ship, if you will, in the middle of a storm, I have uh, this thought for you. I'm going to start with an example that Rick actually used a couple weeks ago in one of his sermons. Um, there was an old movie called The Ten Commandments done a long time ago. Charlton Heston was this, it's kind of in my grandparents' era. It was a famous movie. Cecil B. DeMels was the director. And then there was another movie called Ben-Hur. And in the end of that movie, there was a big chariot scene and Charlton Heston didn't usually do his own uh, stunt work. They had a double. But Cecil B. DeMille's, the director, came to him and said, I really think you should be driving the chariot. I think you ought to stay in the chariot during the race. It should be you because the passion will draw the audience into what we're trying to say. And Charlton Heston said, I, uh, excuse me, I don't know how to drive a chariot. Uh, so they sent him to chariot school. And he comes back and he came to Cecil B. DeMille's and he said, okay, here's the deal. I think I can stay in the chariot and drive the horses, but I cannot guarantee that I'm going to win the race. And Cecil B. DeMille says to him, you stay in the chariot and you leave the race up to me. And that's our metaphor for today. God in the midst of this disaster is asking each of us to stay in the chariot and to trust him for the outcome of the race. And I'm going to boldly suggest to you guys as students, as I did two days ago to all of our national leaders, I'm going to suggest that God is able to use your obedience in this storm to potentially bring salvation to those within your sphere of influence. Let me say that again. I believe that it's possible that through your obedience in this storm, God could bring other people to salvation. Three examples. The first is Noah. In a time of crisis where God was upset that he'd even made mankind, he wanted to destroy the world, and he did destroy the world, but he came to a righteous man, a follower, a believer, and he gave an assignment to Noah to build a ship. No one, I think, at that time knew what a ship was or what it did. It was an odd assignment, but it was in a time of crisis and he was alone. He was the only one called by God to do it. And Noah, through his obedience, through his obedience to God, actually brought salvation to mankind through God's power because he built the boat, his family was preserved, and so were the animals. And so you and I are still here today. But the thought, that act of obedience allowed God through his power to save mankind. Secondly, Moses. 
you know Moses, you know the story of Moses, but God comes to Moses at the burning bush and he has an assignment for him. He makes an assignment. God comes at us in these different ways, particularly in a crisis. And he says to Moses, go to Pharaoh and release my children who are in bondage and captivity. And Moses didn't want to do it. He didn't want to do it. Over and over again, he didn't want to do it. But he obeyed in this crisis that had come about with the slavery and the bondage and the oppression of the people. He went through plagues. He went through the Red Sea. He went through 40 years of wilderness wandering. He went through the golden calf. Moses experienced all these things. And in all of this crisis, in all of the pandemic for Moses, he obeyed God. And through Moses, by God's power, the children of Israel were delivered and saved. Third, Jesus comes to the earth. God be with us. And I imagine him, you guys, standing in the Jordan River, dripping wet. And it's his time. His time has come. And God's voice comes through the clouds and the spirit as a dove lights on him and says, this is my son and my love. With him, I'm well pleased. Man, it's his shining glory. But the scripture says that immediately, in a time of crisis, God calls Jesus to go encounter Satan face to face, life on life, for 40 days when he's hungry, when he's uncertain why he's doing it, and Jesus obeys. And you and I both know as we approach Easter, the great news about the Easter story is that Jesus obeyed till the end, till he was on the cross where he could finally say, it's finished. And because of his obedience, in this time of history crisis, when God was bringing salvation for mankind, because of Jesus' obedience, God, through his power, brought salvation to mankind. And not to be melodramatic, but I believe that about you. I believe that in this time of crisis, when people are hurting when people are fearful, when people are uncertain, when people have family members who have contracted the disease, those who have died, those whose parents have been let go, and they're afraid. And by the way, this isn't just for people who aren't CEOs. All of our CEOs, 200 of them, they're afraid. But in the midst of the storm and when you're afraid, you hear the words of Jesus saying, don't be afraid. Just trust and obey what I've asked you to do. And so Jesus comes to the end of his life. And I love what I'm going to share, um, just a, a passage that's become special to me. Because I wondered sometimes in my own life, when things weren't going my way and when I have my own personal storms, why I doubt or why I cry out to God and ask for this not to be so. Listen to this passage. I'll read it for you. Yet while Christ was here on earth, he pleaded with God, praying with tears and agony of soul to the only one who would save him from premature death. And God heard his prayers because of his strong desire to obey God at all times. His strong desire to be obedient at all times in all situations. His prayers were heard because of that. And even though Jesus was God's son, he had to learn from experience what it was like to obey when obedience meant suffering. It was after he had proved himself perfect in this experience that Jesus became the giver of eternal salvation to all who obey. My message to us this morning, and we could take some time to chat. You can ask me questions about what I see going on in the marketplace. But the essence of this is stay in the chariot and leave the race up to God. Stay in the chariot, obey, trust, believe his promises. One of his most brilliant phrases often repeated is, don't be afraid, I've got this. And you remember he promised us in John 14, I will come again, don't let your hearts be troubled. In my father's house are many rooms. 
If it were not so, I would have told you, but I'm telling you, I'm going to prepare a place for you, right? And he said, I'm coming back to get you, to take you to be with me so that where I am there, you may be also. You know the way to the place where I'm going. So in the midst of the crisis, you can lead and serve and possibly be a conduit to the Rwanda children of salvation by God's power through your obedience in the midst of the storm. One practical thing I thought I might leave with you and then Dr. Marquardt, we can uh, talk, have questions. You can ask me some questions. I'd be happy to, uh, to try to respond. Um, there's a paradox called the Stockdale paradox that you might want to think about. Admiral Stockdale was in the Vietnam War taken as a prisoner of war in what was called the Hanoi Hilton in Vietnam. Seven years, he was a prisoner of war. And he escaped when he was released with his life. Many did not. And what he learned while he was in there was this. When people set their hope on a particular date, if they heard a rumor they were going to be released, let's say at the end of the month, or if they heard a, a rumor that maybe April 30th, the quarantine would be lifted. If they set their hope on that, typically those people died because those dates were never met. But for the people who tried to live each day and not worry about the future or what day would be released or what day we go back to school or what day we can start going into the restaurants, it was those few people who survived the pandemic, who survived the storm. And isn't it interesting that Jesus said, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow's got enough troubles of its own. Trust in me today and let not your hearts be troubled. So my admonition to you as I close, even if you don't exactly know what's happening, stay in the chariot, be obedient to God, Say yes to him and no to Satan and trust him for the victory. That's my message to you today. Well, thank you, Rick. Um, that the Hebrews passage just hit me really hard when you emphasize the words and God heard his prayers, even though we know how those prayers, uh, what, what kind of happened right after Jesus cried out in agony, but, but God, never left him, right? He, uh, he heard those prayers. Um, and, and the whole emphasis on obedience uh, and God's um, faithfulness to us in times when we choose to obey rather than to give in to, to culture, society, or pressures around us. Um, thank you for that. And I realize, so I'm looking at our participant list. We have many people who may not uh, be intimately acquainted with ACU or, um, or uh, Abilene or the Lytle Center. Um, but Dr. Lytle is the namesake for the Lytle Center for Faith and Leadership uh, that sponsors this chapel. Uh, he also founded Leadership Summit with Tim Johnston and Mike Weingart back in 1998. Summit has been a transformational spiritual leadership development course and I just realized I've been falsely advertising this. Um, I've been saying 21 years. It's 22 years. Um, and so God's been working through him in amazing ways. He serves as a, an advisor and director emeritus uh, to the Lytle Center and its activities now. So we're so thankful for that. I do have uh, a question that came through. Um, so well, I think two parts on this, but the first one is, uh, is there a discipline that you're focusing on right now to stay obedient to God? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question because, in fact, we had a call this morning, and one of the things that our CEOs struggle with is this change in structure, and, and Dennis, you've, you've put some material out to try to help with that. Um, it's going to sound cliche -ish. It's going to sound um, simple. It's simple, but it's not easy. Um, Every morning, every morning, win it, win it for Christ in the morning. What we've been trying to do to help our CEOs is uh, we're doing prayer calls all over the United States almost every morning of the week across a bunch of time zones so that 
these CEOs who rarely have anywhere to go or to turn or anybody to talk to because of their positions, um, they come together in a time of prayer. And so I, I think how you stay there, guys, how you stay obedient is just uh, to stay living with Christ and abiding with him and just pray that God um, would, would touch your heart so that you don't, your obedience is from love. And, and gratitude for what he's done and what he's doing. And I'm telling you, right now in my lifetime, never before have I seen so many people open to what you have to say about the rock because everything else in their world is churning and it's fallen off and they see something in you. So I guess what I'm trying to do for myself and I'd encourage you guys to do is um, you, can only, you can only give from the overflow and uh, if, if you, there's a famine in our land, right? Like in Joseph day, there's a famine of grain, but there's a famine in our land right now of hope. But we've got to have enough in our own silo to be able to give that hope to somebody else. So keep your silo full, stay in the chariot and let God give you your assignments every day to try to bless others. It's good stuff. Thank you. Uh, another question is so you're in the trenches with CEOs uh, who are kind of on the front lines of a market that's not doing particularly well in, a, in an economy that's uh, uncertain. And so I'm not sure how much you can share, but uh, are there stories you're hearing about God working uh, amidst all of, all of the uncertainty in the marketplace? Yeah, absolutely. And, and let me say, just because just you have a position called CEO of a major company, you still get dressed every morning like everybody else on the planet and you still are human and you still fear. Um, but what's really cool, and I'll give two examples from Chick-fil-A. So most of us are familiar with Chick-fil-A, uh, the chairman CEO and the COO and president are in the forum. And uh, we were on the phone with them last week in a prayer call. And uh, Tim Tosopoulos is, um, we keep trying to get him to campus and he wants to come. But uh, anyway, the question was asked, are you um, renegotiating your leases? They've got five or 6,000 restaurants across the U.S. alone. And everybody still wants their rent, but they're, they've closed so many of their mall operations. And of course, business is way down. And so the guy was asking, are you renegotiating? And he said, you know, I'll be honest. We've had some tough discussions about that, but here's where we landed. Because God's blessed us and because we're in a financial position that's strong and because we signed contracts, we've decided to pay all of our leases. And he said, what you need to know is that the owner operators who run the, uh, the locations, actually they're responsible for paying them. We contract as a corporation, but the owner operator is responsible for his or her lease payment. And so we wanted to take that burden off of our owner operators, eat that, as a company so that they wouldn't be put in harm's way. And then I asked, second thing I asked him, I said, how's the supply chain? You know, cause this, we've got guys that are running, like one runs Kehi Foods, you know, a $8 billion company trying to keep, everybody's on full 150%, all hands on deck to keep everybody fed. I said, how's the supply chain? Do we have enough chickens? He said, he said, we got plenty of chickens. But he said, here's the interesting thing. He said, in the supply chain, a variety of vendors that we buy from. Some are very large, Tyson, Pilgrims, all the big, there's big houses that we buy from, but we know that there's just hundreds of small to medium sized uh, operations who if we didn't buy from them, they're gonna go out of business. So what we've done is we've taken our list and we're making our decisions based on those we think are most vulnerable, that's kind of scriptural, and we're buying our chicken from them so that they won't suffer during this time of crisis. That gives me goosebumps. But that's running your business according to God's principle. Um, and it just blesses people and it blesses the employees. So those are two stories that I have that just came up last week. Wow, it's amazing uh, to hear that. I, uh, I got chills too when I, when I heard that. Uh, so one, one last question just came through. Uh, we learned, so this is a Leadership Summit alumnus speaking. Oh. Um, we learned at Leadership Summit that the business world is our mission field. To people losing their jobs and having to stay at home, 
How do we best reach out and share the gospel? You know, that's a great question. And I will tell you that the number one issue on every CEO that I work with, mine, is their people. They, they ache for their people. In fact, one of the gentlemen was another big leader down in Houston. He knew he had to make a furlough. He's just looking at his financials and he just, he knew and he was agonized. I mean, these guys have fever blisters. They're not sleeping at night because they, they know. But if, if they go bankrupt, then it, it's, it's, it's very difficult. But he was reading scripture uh, one day last week, Isaiah 58, three, I think was a passage he quoted. And it was a passage about the people crying out to God and, and it's seemingly God not hearing. And the end result of that was God did hear and he did answer their requests. And so he came to us as a, you know, the, as our group and he goes, I've reworked it. I'm not going to let them go. We're doing this. We're going to not pay 401ks. Our, our executive team took 50% salary cuts. They're going to have to take little salary cuts. We're doing this, we're doing this, but I just was convicted by God that, you know, I can't let them go. That's being a compassionate person convicted by, by take care of your people. But there, I think the big, there's no easy answers. Um, so what a lot of our people are talking about doing is just staying in touch with the people, reassuring them, sending them videos and doing everything in their power, really everything to try to keep as many people employed as is possible. And I, I think, Dennis, the last thing I would say, if you're a business major, you're not a business major, whoever's on the call, God, if you look at the theology of who he is, God is also a sustainer. And one of the ways he sustains this earth is through food distribution and housing and clothing. And all of these people, all of us are agents of God's sustaining power for mankind. And these guys take this seriously. And so business today, for me, you just see business people stepping the game up to help save our country, stepping the game up to produce. Deborah Waller, CEO of Jockey, she's one of our members. You know, she was at the White House with everybody else and uh, Doug McMillan at Walmart. Ford Motor Company's producing ventilators. Um, Jockey is making hospital gowns because they've got the capacity to do that. I think it's awesome that these, these people can step up and say, we'll do that, we'll help, we'll make this country uh, you know, live through this. And then the last thing is um, there's a, a tremendous spirit of humility uh, across the land, but particularly in the forum that God, we are not in control, God's in control. And so I, I think the last thing I'd say here is, um, has God got your attention yet? And if he's getting your attention, what's he saying? And I would pray uh, for God to give us eyes to see and ears to hear. And if you don't believe, this Easter weekend is the reason we believe that he did rise, that he is coming again, and that he's sovereign over all things. And that's a message of hope that the world needs to hear right now. Amen. Well said. I, I think we'll close on that, Rick. I can't thank you enough for your words. God's moving. He's mobilizing his people. And uh, he's speaking to us. Um, yep. Are we listening? Uh, hey. Thanks so much. You're welcome. I love COBA. I love ACU. I bleed purple. Uh, just love what you guys are doing. Hang in there. Stay in the chariot. Be obedient. And look what God's going to do. Thank you.